Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Six Flags fourth quarter and full year 2019 earnings conference call. My name is Regina, and I will be your operator for today's call. During the presentation, all lines will be in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's remarks, we will conduct a question and answer session. If you have a question at that time, simply press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, press the pound key. Thank you. I will now turn the call over to Steve Pertel, Senior Vice President, Investor Relations and Treasurer. Good morning, and welcome to our fourth quarter call. With me are Mike Spanos, President and CEO of Six Flags, and Lenny Russ, our Senior Vice President of Strategic Planning and Analysis, and our newly appointed Interim CFO. We will begin the call with prepared comments and then open the call to your questions. Our comments will include forward-looking statements within the meaning of the federal securities laws. These statements are subject to risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ markedly from those described in such statements, and the company undertakes no obligation to update or revise these statements. In addition, on the call, we will discuss non-GAAP financial measures. Investors can find both a detailed discussion of business risks and reconciliations of non-GAAP financial measures to GAAP financial measures in the company's annual reports, quarterly reports, or other forms filed or furnished with the SEC. At this time, I will turn the call over to Mike. Good morning. Although I am disappointed to be sharing difficult news today, I am appreciative of the opportunity to be speaking with you as CEO on my first earnings call with Six Flags. Today we announced that our adjusted EBITDA for 2019 declined by $27 million relative to 2018, clearly an unsatisfactory result. Today we also announced that Marshall Barber has decided to retire from Six Flags effective August 31st. Lenny Ross will act as interim CFO until we identify a successor. We are deeply appreciative to Marshall for his dedicated leadership and service to Six Flags during his 23-year career. Since joining Six Flags in mid-November, I have been listening and learning from our people, visiting all 26 parks, examining the financial statements and capital structure, and studying our processes. I believe it is important to understand the business from the frontline perspective, and I've done this by meeting with team members and witnessing guest interactions firsthand. This experience has confirmed my initial belief that the fundamentals of this business are sound. We have a strong brand, passionate team members, an impressive history, and a healthy industry. However, Organic growth has slowed over the last few years, and this means we need to reinvigorate our company with new ideas and fresh perspectives that address evolving consumer expectations. We need to focus on our base business and deal with two primary issues. First, although we have grown attendance from our active pass base, our organic attendance has declined primarily due to a reduction in single-day visitors. We need to grow both our active pass base and our single-day visitation, and I believe that this is something we can move quickly to address. Second, our operating costs have been increasing at an average rate of nearly 2% over the same period, faster than our base revenue growth of less than 1%, causing operating deleverage and margin compression in our base business. Our park teams have worked hard to offset cost headwinds from minimum and competitive wage increases through other cost savings. However, this has had an adverse effect on the guest experience and created downward pressure in certain areas of our guest satisfaction scores. In addition, we have reduced our marketing spend as a percentage of revenue, which offsets some of the cost pressures we faced, but negatively impacted our ability to reach new consumers. The net result has been a contraction in modified EBITDA margin and a decline in total modified and adjusted EBITDA due to base costs growing faster than base revenue. This margin erosion is also something I believe we can begin to address quickly and make further progress on over the long term. In order to deliver exceptional long-term shareholder returns, we need to reverse these revenue and cost trends, driving both attendance and revenue growth while improving productivity to increase profit margins. 
Doing this requires us to adapt our strategy to today's dynamic consumer environment and to evolve our operating model to both counter the higher wage environment and deliver a better guest experience. This is not the first time I have navigated through this type of situation. After graduating from the U.S. Naval Academy and spending six years in the Marine Corps, I spent 26 years at PepsiCo. During that time, I led a number of business transformations in both domestic and international markets. I have a successful track record of reinvigorating profitable growth. The results they delivered for PepsiCo give me great confidence that I can achieve the same success at Six Flags. I am eager to lead our committed teams to reestablish Six Flags as a strong and sustainable total shareholder return success story. I strive to be a developer of people, as well as a coach and motivator for our teams. I bring both a disciplined approach and results orientation and driving change. I believe that leadership is a privilege that is constantly re-earned and never to be taken for granted based on position or title. As a new leader of Six Flags, I have four commitments to you. First, I will be deliberate, strategic, and long-term focused in my decision-making. Second, I will instill a strong sense of urgency amongst our teams to address the issues we are facing. Third, I will communicate our progress along the way in a complete and transparent manner. And fourth, I will hold the team and myself accountable for delivering strong results. I fully understand the magnitude of these disappointing results to our shareholders, and I am committed to reinvigorating sustained, healthy, and profitable growth that delivers long-term shareholder value. Before I share some additional thoughts on the company, I will turn the call over to Lenny to provide details of our 2019 financial results and 2020 outlook. Lenny? Thank you, Mike, and good morning to everyone on the call. I've been with Six Flags for over 30 years, working in both our parks and headquarters. I started as a frontline employee in games during high school and held many different management positions in our in-park services division until graduating college. Since then, I've had the opportunity to work in many financial roles over the last 20 plus years, including creating the company's internal audit function, serving as the chief accounting officer, and fulfilling my current role as the senior vice president of strategic planning and analysis. I appreciate the opportunity to fill the interim CFO role and to participate on today's call. I will start with a discussion of our fourth quarter and full year 2019 performance and then address our 2020 financial outlook and first quarter dividend. Our total revenue in the fourth quarter declined by $9 million or 3% to $261 million. Attendance declined 202,000 or 3% to 6.1 million guests. Our six recently acquired parks, which include the five parks we began operating in June 2018 and Magic Waters, which we began operating in April 2019, had a negligible impact on revenue and attendance comparisons to the prior year quarter. Most of our attendance decline was due to softness at our two parks in Mexico and at Six Flags Magic Mountain in Los Angeles. The majority of this decline occurred late in the fourth quarter. Our parks in Mexico experienced two issues. The first was austerity measures put in place by the new president, which significantly reduced government-sanctioned school group visits to our parks. The second was an unfortunate accident at a nearby theme park, which has negatively affected people's desire to visit any theme park in the area. At Magic Mountain, we experienced poor weather, nearby fires, and a delay in introducing our major new ride West Coast Racers, which did not open until after Christmas. Collectively, these items had a significant impact on our fourth quarter and full year attendance. Since the opening of West Coast Racers, we have seen an improvement in attendance trends. Guest spending per capita in the quarter decreased slightly. Admissions per capita decreased 48 cents due to a reduction in single day paid attendance, which accounted for all of our attendance loss in the quarter. In park spending per capita increased 45 cents due to higher spending from members, new culinary and retail offerings for holiday in the park, and our all season dining program. 
On the cost side, cash operating and SG&A expenses increased by $14 million, or 9%, primarily due to $10 million of charges related to our China development agreements and certain unrelated litigation matters. Without these impacts, costs were up about 3%. Modified and adjusted EBITDA for the quarter were both $72 million, a $24 million decline from the prior year quarter. Moving to full year 2019 performance, total revenue for the year increased $24 million, or 2%, to approximately $1.5 billion. This was driven by 2% attendance growth, partially offset by a $3 million decrease in sponsorship, international agreements, and accommodations revenue. Admissions revenue increased $6 million, or less than 1%, and in-park revenue was up $21 million, or 4%. Attendance grew by 788,000 to 32.8 million guests, an increase of 2%. Our six acquired parks contributed over 90% of the increase, and their attendance for the year totaled 2.8 million guests. Our legacy parks grew attendance by 65,000, or less than 1% to 30 million guests. For the year, guest spending per capita decreased 21 cents or less than 1%. At both our legacy parks and our recently acquired parks, guest spending per capita was virtually flat. A higher mix of attendance from the recently acquired parks drove the overall decrease due to the lower per capita spending at the parks. At the legacy parks, early season membership promotions and an elevated level of discounted bring a friend tickets from our membership and season pass programs negatively impacted per cap growth, offsetting the positive impact of price increases in higher priced memberships. Full year cash operating costs, which includes cost of goods sold, cash operating expenses, and cash SG&A expenses, were up 6% or $50 million in 2019 due to the following items. Incremental costs of $25 million in our five domestic parks acquired in 2018, primarily in the first five months of the year, including lease expense and cost to operate and rebrand the parks. Incremental costs to lease and operate our sixth acquired park, Magic Waters, Increased costs from mandated minimum wage increases and competitive wage rate adjustments in several labor markets. A $9 million or 7% increase in cost of goods sold due to a higher volume of food sold through our all-season dining program. And the costs related to China and certain unrelated litigation matters recorded in the fourth quarter that we previously disclosed in the 8K on January 10th. Excluding expenses associated with the acquired parks and the China and litigation expenses recorded in the fourth quarter, our costs for the year were virtually flat. We were able to offset the cost pressures mentioned above by reducing labor costs primarily through contingency labor-saving measures and the reduction of incentive compensation earned due to our financial results. Full-year diluted GAAP earnings per share decreased $2.11 from $3.23 in 2018, primarily due to higher stock-based compensation expenses related to the reversal of the accrual for the unearned Project 600 Performance Award in the prior year. The higher operating expenses previously mentioned and the recording of evaluation allowance related to our foreign tax credits due to the termination of our China contracts. We generated $527 million of adjusted EBITDA in 2019, a decrease of $27 million, or 5%, compared to 2018, and our modified EBITDA margin was 38%, a decrease of 238 basis points. As Mike mentioned, our base business growth has been slowing over the past few years. I will now break out the performance of our legacy business for 2019 which excludes our six recently acquired parks and international development. Revenue grew $1 million versus 2018. Cash operating costs, including cost of goods sold, increased $15 million, or 2%. Full year adjusted EBITDA was $483 million, a decrease of $15 million, or 3%. 
The modified EBITDA margin at our legacy parts was 39%, a 107 basis point decrease from 2018. Turning to our six new parks, they have outperformed the expectations we had prior to operating them. In 2019, they generated 2.8 million of attendance and $95 million of revenue with total guest spending per capita of $31.58 and a modified EBITDA margin of 14%. They generated over $13 million of adjusted EBITDA in 2019, net of $16 million in rent and we expect to further improve the park's profitability over time. On a comparable period basis, the five parks we began operating in 2018 had attendance growth of 8%, revenue growth of 11%, and EBITDA growth of 28%. Moving back to total company performance, the active pass base, which represents the total number of guests enrolled in the company's membership program, or that have a season pass, was down 3% compared to prior year in. Within our active pass base, we increased our active member base by 18% to 2.6 million members, but this was not enough to offset the decline in season pass sales we experienced during the year end holiday sales period. Attendance from the active pass base remained at 63% in 2019 for the total company. With our legacy parks increasing slightly to 64%, in our newly acquired parks growing from 45% to 55%. Deferred revenue was $144 million, representing a $2 million or 1% decrease over prior year. The decrease was due to an increasing proportion of members who have been with us for more than 12 months who no longer contribute to the deferred revenue balance, as well as lower season pass sales in the fall partially offset by higher average membership and season pass prices. Adjusted free cash flow for 2019 was $246 million, a decline of $47 million relative to 2018. The company invested $140 million in capital expenditures and paid $279 million in dividends. Our ratio of dividend payments to adjusted free cash flow and net income in, in 2019 was 114% and 156% respectively. Our net leverage ratio at year end was 4.0 times at the high end of our target range of three to four times net leverage. Before turning to our 2020 financial guidance, I'd like to provide additional details on the challenges we are facing related to our international development projects. In China, our partner was unable to meet the financial terms of our contract. Last month, we issued default notices for a lack of payment. Since that time, they did not cure their defaults, and we terminated our agreements with them this month. Therefore, we are planning with the assumption that there will be no revenue in 2020 from our activities in China. Going forward, we still see a future opportunity to leverage our brand with a rapidly growing middle class and emerging markets, but we will be very cautious as we consider potential international projects and progress is likely to be slow. As we execute our 2020 plan, we have issued 2020 EBITDA guidance of $435 million to $465 million, which incorporates the following assumptions. The loss of approximately $30 million of EBITDA from our international development agreements. Increased OPEX of nearly $20 million due to wage increases, including higher minimum wages, competitive labor rates, and full-time merit salary increases. Additional OPEX investments of $20 million for park maintenance projects and operational improvements that are relevant to our guests and team member experiences, along with additional marketing investments focused on growing single-day attendance programs and improving our share of voice in key markets. Restoring a bonus of approximately $20 million to support employee retention and recruitment and organic revenue growth of approximately 1%, which is consistent with the current trend. Given the significant drop in expected free cash flow versus 2019, our elevated dividend payout ratio and our projected leverage ratio above our target range in 2020, the board carefully considered what is in the best long-term interest of the company and all of its stakeholders. 
As a result, we reduced the first quarter dividend to 25 cents per share, which equates to an annualized dividend of $1. This level will target a payout ratio of approximately 50 to 60% of adjusted free cash flow based on our guidance range and current level of capital spending, and therefore maintain a consistent and sustainable dividend income for our shareholders. This dividend level will also help to effectively manage our balance sheet and leverage ratio and free up available cash to make targeted investments in our business with strong returns to enhance the guest experience. Now, I will turn the call back over to Mike. Thank you, Lenny. I would like to share some forward-looking thoughts about three topics. Our foundation for future success, our strategic plan approach, and our leadership and governance. The first topic is our foundation for future success. Six Flags is the industry's leading innovator with a beloved 58-year-old brand, dedicated employees, and loyal guests. We operate in highly attractive markets, including the top 10 DMAs in the U.S., and our unique assets provide a truly differentiated experience in themed entertainment. In addition, regional theme parks are a stable industry that benefit from high barriers to entry. With limited direct competition, the industry has exhibited pricing power and consistent profit growth over a multi-decade period, including the last few years. The industry is currently on trend as experiences are the fastest growing category of all consumer expenditures, and theme parks offer an affordable form of thrilling entertainment for guests of all ages. While these foundations are favorable, we as a company have underperformed. I believe there are significant opportunities to improve our performance. This brings me to my second topic, our strategic plan approach. I'm working very hard with the team to reassess the business in a thoughtful and methodical manner and to develop a comprehensive strategic plan that addresses our revenue growth, margin improvement, and capital deployment opportunities for the next three to five years. To accomplish this, we are obtaining valuable support from Boston Consulting Group to ensure an external perspective on our plan. We expect to share a comprehensive and exciting strategic path forward at an investor day on May 28th. In the very near term, we have already identified several areas that offer opportunities for improvement. First, over the past few years, the number of single day visitors has declined particularly during the heart of our summer season. While we have partially offset this decline through an increased visitation from our active pass base, we have an opportunity to grow our attendance by recapturing lost single-day guests with focus offers that do not erode our active pass base visitation. Second, we are quickly moving to simplify our membership and season pass offerings and registration process, which will help us attract and retain consumers into our active pass base. Finally, within our parks, there's an opportunity to incorporate technology to streamline the end-to-end guest experience, improve culinary, and improve operating efficiency and productivity. These are just a few immediate examples that we have chosen to highlight, and there are many more we will share with you soon. The third topic I would like to speak about is our leadership and governance. This is something I've always found to be the critical foundation for success. In order to achieve our full potential, we must have the best leadership team in place with the right individual and collective capabilities to meet the high standards of our guests, team members, and shareholders. The team needs to be motivated with the right incentive programs that deliver long-term shareholder value. Project 750 is not realistically attainable, so we will move away from project-based long-term incentives and replace them with restricted stock and performance stock units that more closely align with current market practice and shareholder expectations. Performance criteria will consist of adjusted EBITDA, revenue growth, and adjusted EBITDA minus CapEx. We will maintain our current short-term incentives that tie completely to company financial and operational performance. Given the challenged state of the business, I suggested and the board agreed that I will not participate in the bonus plan for 2020. Finally, as we rebuild our company to deliver strong and sustainable earnings growth, 
we will continue our process of augmenting and evolving the board with skills and experiences that provide the leadership team with strategic guidance as we meet the needs of our guests. We welcome H Partners, a large and long-standing shareholder, back to our board of directors. We value H Partners as a collaborative and strategic partner of Six Flags as we move forward. In addition, we are currently interviewing additional highly qualified and diverse candidates that bring strong operating CEO backgrounds with digital, culinary, and commercial experience. We expect to announce new directors in the near future. As I said at the beginning of the call, urgency, transparency, and accountability are priorities for me. Our recent performance has not met our expectations, and we will act quickly and decisively with a focus on our base business to improve results. We will openly communicate both good and bad news to ensure that we provide an accurate depiction of our performance during this transitional phase. And we will hold ourselves accountable for delivering on our commitments. We look forward to updating you on our progress during the first quarter earnings call and during our investor day once our full strategy is developed. Before I open the call to questions, I want to emphasize that I've been with the company about three months and I'm still formulating our strategy and plans. For that reason, my comments have been focused on 2019 and 2020. And I've not gone into any detail about our long-term strategy, our future capital allocation plans, any strategic alternatives, or any period beyond 2020. Regina, at this point, could you please open the call for any questions? At this time, if you would like to ask a question, please press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. That is star one. Our first question will come from the line of James Hardiman with Wedbush Securities. Hey, good morning. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Um, so, Mike, you, you seem like a, a straight shooter. Um, <laughs> so, you know, um, I'll, I'll keep that in mind here. Um, <clears throat> obviously, based on the fourth quarter results, uh, the news out of China, uh, and the and the 2020 guidance, it seems like you know you're you're now this is now a turnaround story, uh, pretty evidently. I guess the first question is, when you came on board. Um, did you realize that that's what you were getting yourself into? Uh, it seems like things really snowballed here over the last couple of months, um, uh, uh, in particular with, with regards to China, but, but certainly the domestic story. It, it seems like stuff that was maybe building for a while, um, really from our perspective, just, just came to light. So maybe talk about the last few months uh, and what really stood out to you uh, as you collected all of the, all of the data at your new company. Uh, James, thanks for your question, and uh, let me start with uh, my first 90 days have only reinforced uh, we got a very healthy industry, we got a great brand, we got great people, and we got really strong cash flow. Um, and I'm excited to be here, uh, and I was excited to join. Um, so I'll start there. Um, and let me break down your other two parts. It was uh, China and domestic. Um, on China, um, we, we were very disappointed um, with the termination of our agreements with Riverside Group. Uh, once we knew Riverside Group had invested hundreds of millions of dollars into the projects, was unable to make payments, we delivered notices of default and notified investors. Um, as a perspective, I've lived there, uh, I've led businesses there. It's a, an extremely fluid environment uh, in China, and uh, as well as with partners. Um, so as we said, we're not playing any revenue growth uh, there, and uh, that gets me to the second part, which is our focus needs to be on our base business, uh, which you raised. Um, and here we, we have a good business. Uh, as I said, I just think there's two fundamental things we got to focus on on our base business. Um, we've, as we've done well with active passes, we need to ensure we're growing our single day tickets, uh, which is very important to our total attendance and to our total revenue. And in addition, as I said, we've got to really make sure that OPEX is not growing faster than our revenue line. That just uh, doesn't bode well. So um, as we move forward, I think we got a, we got a really good foundation. Um, and we're going to be very focused, by the way, on the investments that we make in our base business to ensure they deliver strong returns. Your next question will come from the line of Brett Andrus with KeyBank Capital Markets. 
Hey, uh, good morning. Um, so, Mike, I, I know it's early, but just from a high level, how are you thinking about the capital expenditures in this business going forward? I mean, the argument, you know, has been out there for a while that, you know, 9% capex, the percent of sales, you know, may have just been too low over a long period of time. So, you know, how do you view the current capital pipeline for the business? Yeah, hey, good morning, Brett. How you doing? Um, yeah, so first on, on capital allocation, good, good question. As I said, um, it is my intent to provide uh, detailed feedback on all the capital allocation May 28th at our investor day as part of the holistic strategy. Um, now, having said that, we, we've got really good cash flow, and I like the resiliency we have versus potential recessions uh, given our business. Uh, what we will do and what I've done in the short term, what the board agreed to, is to focus on long-term shareholder interests. Uh, as Lenny said, targeting between a three to a four net leverage ratio. Uh, we're in the high range now, so I think it's very important we maintain a healthy balance sheet and uh, be thoughtful in that regard. Uh, therefore, we, we, we did reduce the dividend. Uh, you didn't ask that, but I think that's part of it. We did reduce the dividend to target a payout ratio of approximately 50 to 60 percent of adjusted free cash flow based on the guidance range. Um, so, and, and as we move forward, I, again, I want to come back to, I, I just think, again, we need to focus on our base business as we develop our strategy, leverage the great brands, people drive it, and we've got a good industry that I think provides some uh, good tailwind, and we just need to be very thoughtful and responsible in the way we allocate that capital. And we'll be very transparent as we make those decisions, Brett. Understood. Um, and just one last one for me. If you could just help me with the incremental operating expense. Uh, that you're going to spend for 2020 is is it simply you know more labor that you need to invest in to improve the guest experience um, i mean i guess what did you find in these guest satisfaction surveys that that made you kind of you know come to this conclusion yeah i got it and, you know just again uh, lenny mentioned it but you got about 20 million dollars in in wages uh brett minimum wages some competitive pressures uh and then you've got as well uh as we discussed uh, two other things. The second is is ideally instilling a bonus back for our team. Our team um, is going to receive a zero bonus for 2019 results. Uh, so ideally, we'd like to uh, deliver because it's important to recruit and retain the right talent to drive the strategy long term. Uh, so that's potentially another 20 million, as you mentioned. Now, specific to the uh, the marketing and the OPEX, which was the other $20 million that Lenny uh, referenced, um, we're going to be very thoughtful and methodical here, and we're going to target that money into what we think are the right parks with the right investments with the right returns. Uh, based on what the guests are telling us. Um, and so we do look at uh, the guest data. It's, it's done well. We also are looking at third-party data as well uh, to see how we're trending. So we will continue to look at things around uh, clean, fast, uh, friendly, and food as we look at uh, these types of investments. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Steve Wazinski with Stiefel. Yeah, hey, guys. Good morning. Um, Mike, so you talked about how core growth has slowed, and, and I know you don't want to go into too many of your kind of ideas in terms of how you can turn that around. You're going to probably highlight that, at, you know, in May. But I guess bigger question is, um, you know, it, you know, it seems your core attendance commentary is somewhat, I guess, different than some of your peers. And I understand there's obviously differences between you know, between different companies, but you know, it's still somewhat confusing as to why the differences in attendance metrics between you know you guys and and, and, and like I said, your peers. Do you have any you know like high level thoughts in terms of, of what some of those differences could be, or you know how you can go about trying to combat those? I, I can, and, and thanks, Steve, for the question. Uh, first, uh, as Lenny said, if you look at 2019, we we had real. Uh, pronounced headwinds on attendance, uh, predominantly driven by Mexico and uh, Magic Mountain in California. That, that was roughly probably at least half the problem. Uh, so we saw some significant acute issues there, as Lenny mentioned. Um, second, on the positive side, we had some really strong performance that came out of the uh, recently acquired parks that was very positive from a mo momentum standpoint. Uh, now, when you look at the rest of the area, it brings me back to, again, that 
we, although we grew our active pass space uh, in the past, we need to grow our single day visitation. Um, that to me is the key. And, and that will require us to be thoughtful in terms of our consumer value uh, and how we grow our single day tickets uh, for folks that have out of pocket absolute spending limitations, call it the value uh, consumers. While we also grow our active pass space, when those are folks that tend to be willing to trade up on what I would call the consumer value incentive curve, where they'll pay a little more and continue to pay more for benefits. We're going to need to grow both. Uh, and I think we did a really good job of growing active pass, especially on the membership, but we have to do both. Uh, and again, as I said, with the right uh, pivot uh, in our brands uh, and our people, uh, given the industry and our cash flow, I, I, I think we hopefully will be able to see uh, uh, pretty good momentum as we make these decisions. Uh, okay, and then uh, again, a bigger question, bigger picture question. I don't, again, I don't think you're going to answer this, but because you kind of addressed it towards the end of your remarks. But uh, you know, Mike, do you? Is basically what I'm trying to get here is, is anything on the table at this point? And what I mean by that is, you know, whether that could be strategic alternatives, that could be selling assets, that could be looking at monetizing, you know, real estate of the company. But uh, you know, is basically anything on the table right now? Right. Yeah, so it, it, another good question, Steve. Um, you know, first of all, it's my fiduciary responsibility to shareholders to always look at all options, right? Um, uh, having said that, I believe that we have a great ability to grow the business organically, focusing on the base business, and I also believe that will build the best long-term uh, shareholder value. Uh, and what I would say, maybe the other part uh, your question, if you, maybe you're uh, starting to lead into potential M&A or, or deals like that, to me, the decision tree has always been very simple on this. The first is, what is strategically relevant? Second, does it deliver shareholder value? And uh, third is, do we have the right to succeed in that direction or someone else? And I've always been very disciplined on that. But bottom line is, I, I think we have a good base organic business, uh, and growing that is going to deliver the best long-term shareholder value, and that's where we should focus. Okay, thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Your next Thank question you. comes from the line of David Katz with Jeffries. Uh, hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, David. Uh, good morning. Thank you for your commentary and for taking my question. Um, two questions, please. Uh, number one, if you could just talk about your degree of confidence around, you know, the guidance that we have for 2020, and, you know, obviously that's connected to where the dividend is set. Obviously, people on our side are always, you know, looking to make sure that there isn't, you know, another shoe uh, to drop. You, you want me to take the first question uh, first, David? You said you had two. I just, just wanted to be respectful. I, you, well, yes. No, I, I'll, okay. I'll give no, you no. both, and then you can you can do whatever order you'd like. My second question is, um, you know, with respect to, and I, I, given your background is globally oriented, um, do, is it your assessment thus far that, you know, Six Flags has uh, the kinds of assets, the brand and the operating, you know, model, uh, that lends itself to developing a global pipeline of, of you know, growth for the parks? Those are my two questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry about the, uh, the pause there. Um, let, let, me, um, okay. let me, David, let me start with a degree of uh, confidence and guidance. Um, uh, we, made, uh, we, uh, we felt it was important to be transparent, um, and, uh, and I know that gets back to some of the other questions uh, about not having a comprehensive story that includes capital allocation. Um, but we felt it was to be, uh, we should be transparent and give shareholders our best assessment of what the business would deliver for 2020. Um, as we move through the year, we will absolutely update everyone, communicate uh, where we're going, how we're doing, uh, and what I know, shareholders will know. Um, and that, that's what I would tell you. We, we spent a lot of time on this, and we feel this is appropriate as we make the right investments in the base business and also deliver long-term shareholder value. Um, to, to your second question, um, First, actually, the majority of my time, I, I did spend seven years uh, internationally in, in my career as a, as a civilian, uh, so to speak. Um, but um, the, the rest of that was running domestic businesses, predominantly, by the way, on the bottling side, very asset-heavy, very people-heavy, 
tight margins, uh, it's, you know, grind it out, blocking and tackling, executional games. So uh, I do, that is my kind of uh, muscle memory, uh, so to speak. Uh, now, so I would say that it feels, uh, that experience feels right to leading Six Flags, specifically to global or international right to succeed. I typically look at uh, three things, David, when I think about international businesses based on my experience uh, living and working there. Uh, the first is what's what's our right to succeed? Uh, that can get into the country, foreign direct investment. Is there developing emerging middle class? Just is it a place that loves Western brands? Okay, that's one. Uh, the second thing is it's about capability. Somebody's going to run our parks. The system capability has got to be great to uphold the Six Flags brand and quality standards. And then the third is the partner. Uh, you have to have a good, viable partner. If any of those three break down, uh, you struggle. And in the middle of that is your business model. Uh, so um, we'll be cautious. We'll be very disciplined on international uh, programs. Uh, we are excited about our Kadia Park. That'll open up in 2023 in Saudi. Uh, but at this point, Point, uh, we'll be very thoughtful and methodical as we focus on our base business. That's perfect. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Your next question comes from the line of Michael Swartz with SunTrust Robinson Humphrey. Hey, good morning. Uh, Mike, maybe more of a philosophical question now that you've had some time to look under the under the hood and, and talk to various park oper- uh, various members of your parks. I mean, I guess how do you think – or what is what do you think is the right long term growth profile for a uh, what's called a healthy well run park operator? Yeah, thanks, Michael. Good morning to you. Um, you know, the first is what I would say to your point. Uh, the, the best part of uh, the job I've had so far is getting out to our parks. I, I mean, the stories are they're phenomenal. We we have great people out there. They they've given their lives to this business. They're incredibly committed, passionate, and uh, it, it's a fun business. It really is a neat business. Um, you know, what I would say is the, the first thing is, I, I, as I look at the industry, Michael, it, it's the industry broadly, whether I look at location-based entertainment, tourism, theme parks, out-of-home spending, feels good uh, in, 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 in a really good uh, way, meaning you got decent, sustained, steady growth. As far as our long-term growth range, I, that would be something that we will be much more complete, and I would have a... a we're giving you at the Investor Day, May 28th, as we work through that. But it, what I would say is I do believe the industry is good. I like our brand. I like our people. I like our business. I do think we will deliver sustained long-term shareholder earnings growth. Okay. And then just with, with your, I guess, your, your focus on rebuilding the single-day visitation base, uh, is there anything as you look at the business today and, and maybe benchmark it, you know, where do you want to get on that front? You know, what, there's always a balance between season pass and, and um, or, or the active pass base and, and single day visitors. And how much of growing that is really being more active or aggressive on the pricing, fr- uh, pricing front? There's always been this strategy of low to mid single digit pricing. So it, is that going to change as part of that strategy? I, yeah, I don't. I don't think it's it's a change, uh, Michael. I think it's more evolution. Meaning, the way I look at it is, uh, there's consumer demand spaces in every industry, and we need to be thoughtful in our base business offers that meet that cohort's need, whether they just want to come to our park for a single day. And like I said, that could be a value consumer that has a very fixed out-of-pocket spend, and they're going to make that day trip for that day. Ideally, when we recruit them like that, I want them to become recurring and bring them into the active pass space. But not all may do that. I also have other cohorts that they just love our parks and they want a high frequency of use and they're willing to upspend for more benefits and they have more elasticity in their personal income to do that. That is ideal for the active pass base. We want both. And, and I, the revenue management finesse is having the right consumer value between price and benefits that recruits and retains both. And that is an art and 
science. I, I, and, and by the way, I think it's got to be very focused, very local to our local consumers around our parks, and we've got to be very database and assessing it because you you, you got to make sure that the the rate or inflationary and the mix impacts of these move bode well in terms of total margin dollars, total revenue, and how it translates into the per capita uh, lines of the P&L. But again, Great. I think if you look at our base business, I, I think we can do both. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Tyler Batori with Janie Capital Markets. Hi, good morning. Thanks for taking my questions. Uh, so I just wanted to follow up on the attendance topic here. You know, I have a few questions on the active pass base specifically. Uh, can you just talk, you know, generally high level, you know, what you think about the membership program and, and what you think about membership tiers? And then, you know, the active pass base, I think, was down 3%, and it sounds like you're, you're growing membership, but the, the pass is down. So can you just talk a little bit more about what's going on um, with the season pass being down and, and kind of the, what's the last question here I mean do you have a preference I mean I know you want to grow the overall active pass base but I mean would you rather grow membership or would you rather grow uh, or focus on growing the season pass specifically side of things well good morning Tyler uh, how are you so I, I'll, I'll take a, a crack at this and see if Lenny wants to jump in I, I again I, I think that um, we want to grow both uh, and now I'm specifically breaking apart active and season pass because again if I split that uh, season pass again is a different cohort demand space that is different than potentially a member who wants a full year uh, program with us again ideally want to keep moving them up second to your point I think our membership program is very good uh, as I said the team we're looking at it uh, do we need to simplify it based on park feedback uh, and make things cleaner on the website and a little cleaner in the sales centers uh, I, I believe the answer is yes to that question specifically I think we need to simplify it um, but to me, we need to be looking at both uh, in terms of growing both and, again, being very thoughtful on the offering that we have. Yeah, on membership specifically, uh, the goal would still be to continue to really drive people through the membership program. Uh, they do stay with us longer. Uh, they visit more frequently. They spend more when they're in the parks. And their memberships are sold at an a, a higher average price. So long term, it's still the right strategy to continue to focus on membership, and we'll continue to find ways to make people uh, upgrade to that program. Uh, but again, as Mike said, all, all facets of the business are critical for uh, growth long term. Okay, great. And then my second question, I just wanted to ask a little bit more about uh, the guest experience. And, 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 Mike, I know you spent a lot of time in the parks for the past couple of months. You know, I know Six Flags does a lot of guest surveys and whatnot. Just can you talk a little bit about, you know, guest satisfaction and, and what sorts of things are customers telling you that they want to see improved in the parks? Uh, very good question, uh, and, and, and Tyler, maybe I'll, I'll elevate to this level. What, we're, what I'm seeing is, in our business, we're, we're going to have to be really thoughtful, uh, both with the consumer and the guest, and, and, and I would actually separate them. Um, for both, um, there is a share of mind uh, challenge as well as a share wallet. The share wallet, I, I find, tends to be more what is going on in the park, what you're trying to get out of the guest's pocket, and the share of mind is how you get their attention. And what we're specifically hearing in terms of the guest to that point is, as we deal with that, they want differentiated experiences. They want digital expression. They want authenticity and brands, and they're very aspirational. Um, and what they want is very they want more bang for the buck per minute and per hour in the parks, which pushes us to deal with the evolving experience they want and really think end-to-end -end guests, which I think becomes uh, very important for us to, to be sharp on that in terms of how we are very sharp on what they want from when they're on the website to when they drive out of the parking lot. Now, specifically, the, the two areas that I've seen really create uh, both uh, opportunity and challenges is time and technology. What we're seeing with our guests and consumers, they are much more time stressed. Uh, so as I said, they want more bang for the buck when they're in the park. In technology, it's a great enabler to create a great, memorable guest experience, but it also causes fragmentation. And so again, as we think about our base business, 
invest with our people, invest in the brand. We've got to evolve with the consumer and invest in the end-to-end guest experience. Okay, great. That's all for me. Thank you for the detail. Yes, sir. Your next question comes from the line of Tim Condor with Wells Fargo Securities. Thank you, and uh, Mike, welcome aboard. And uh, uh, and uh, and jumping in the deep end here from from the get go, and and for the color so far, sir, we appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to revisit maybe just a couple of um, uh, housekeeping items first. Um, the active pass percent of attendance uh, total all in. Is that the the sixty three sixty four percent? Just wanted to confirm that, and then any comment on how you, the unique guest um, trended in nineteen versus versus eighteen? I, I suspect it's down given sort of the color commentary you've given so far. But just any color on that, if you could. Yes. I, good morning, Tim. How are you? Um, the uh, yes, the active pass uh, to answer that question is uh, at approximately sixty three percent as a house. Uh, Keeping note, and, and yes, the uh, unique uh, visitors were down in uh, 2019 versus 2018 on the base business, and that's why I said I, I, our problem to solve is focusing on that base business, uh, investing back in the brands and the right parks and the right experience to get that back up. Okay, and then and one other, uh, I guess, just metric, um, uh, kind of on an annualized basis. I know you guys get, uh, uh, can provide that. I think um, the visitation frequency from your Active Pass base, um, how did that go on a, on a year over year basis, and just any absolute point uh, uh, as to where that is? Yeah, uh, Tim, good question. It was slightly up uh, in terms of frequency of visitation. It, it did increase slightly. Okay. Okay. Um, and then, and then to to the the single day focus um, with the value consumer. Um, uh, yeah, it, it seems like uh, others in the in the industry over the last year or so have said, hey, we don't want to leave that consumer behind, and maybe target some of the shoulder periods with specifically, as you mentioned, park targeted, database targeted uh, 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 approach, uh, while while still uh, preserving the the, the active pass base. Um, how how if you, if that's built quite a bit I guess how do you balance the value that that consumer is getting versus the active pass base who you know demands a higher value more experiences um, uh, and is willing to pay for it how do you balance that trade off I guess uh, uh, as far as as, uh, as what you're, you're looking to do in in the parks with the, the experiences and, and other things that I know are again still evolving and, and more details to come on that. It's a really good question, Tim, and a lot of this also I think we'll get deeper in the strategy, but to me it really uh, ultimately you've got to look at the park. Are you seeing an improvement in the margin dollars, the margin per caps, uh, visitation frequencies, attendance, et cetera? Those metrics are pretty clear. Now, specifically what we're doing is we're, we're being very focused and testing um, single-day ticket offers, and what we're doing is we're testing what is the incrementality of them, what is the right consumer value, uh, what it takes to deliver that right value uh, for that more value-based consumer. So we're being very, very thoughtful and focused and um, disciplined in how we're doing that. But to me, I think we're going to ultimately be looking at the revenue lines, the per capita lines, and the attendance lines uh, by park to see how that's playing out for us as we invest back into the big business. Okay, and then uh, lastly, sir, if I may, um, uh, on the on the opex, uh, you, you gave the sort of the three buckets uh, going on there. How should we? Again, I know it's early; it's preliminary. A lots evolving here, uh, so maybe a hard question. But how should we maybe think about that spend here over the next? two, three years maybe as a percentage? Should we kind of expect it to kind of stay at this elevated level for a few years and then see where we go from there? Is that sort of the, the best way to think about that here on a, on a very early basis? 
Yeah, oh, Tim, yeah, I mean, labor is roughly, you know, half the cost base, and, and I think that's a, a reality we're, we're going to have to deal with as we move forward. Um, and, and obviously, we'll have these headwinds. We've seen uh, these minimum wage increases come in about seven uh, states so far. Uh, we, do so, we do have some more headwind there that we, we know is coming. Um, as far as the specific uh, rate of OPEX, uh, that is one, uh, again, I'm going to want to come back to you at the Investor Day, May 28th, where we have a real good feel of how we can drive technology to leverage productivity. Uh, because I think fundamentally what's going to happen here, uh, Tim, is the technology should be an enabler for the end-to-end -end guest experience, but should also be an enabler to drive productivity. And that is the work we're going to have to take on. And once we do that, we're going to have a better sense of how we deal with the headwinds and create some tailwinds. Okay. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Your next question will come from the line of Alex Marocchia with Berenberg. Hey, good morning, guys, and welcome, Mike and Lenny. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. So can you first just give us the revenue recognized from international licensing in 19? Uh, sure, uh, and thank you for uh, for welcoming us. <laughs> revenue for the year was uh, $41.2 million, uh, and EBITDA contribution for the year was $30 million. Got it. Okay. So based off of that, it looks like revenues from the sponsorship part of that line item are starting to become a growth driver a bit. So I think I got 30.3% growth in there. So how are you viewing this opportunity, and can you discuss the margin profile? Uh, sure. Uh, I mean, we're very uh, lucky to have our sponsorship uh, group. Uh, we do over $37 million of revenue annually. Um, also embedded in that category is our accommodations line item. And if you recall, last year we acquired Darien Lake, and they have a big accommodations uh, business because they have a campground as well as a hotel. So the majority of that growth outside of international came in the accommodations line item. Gotcha. Okay. That's helpful. Um, and, and then holding long-term debt steady and considering your adjusted EBITDA guidance for the year, it looks like you'd be on track to finish 2020 around four and a half times leverage. Can you discuss this year's debt priorities? Go ahead. Yeah, Alex, hi, it's Mike. Um, yeah, that's you're, you're about right uh, on the uh, the net leverage ratio. Um, and our that's why I said we've got good cash flow, very strong cash flow. The, the, look, we, we want to make sure uh, we stay. Uh, the ratings are important to us. Uh, we're very focused on keeping a very healthy balance sheet. I think that's in the best interest of, of our shareholders, especially our long-term shareholders. So that will be the top priority uh, with uh, any extra cash cash that comes our way. We think that's the right thing to do to get back between that three and four. Okay. That's helpful. Thanks, guys. Your next question comes from the line of Ryan Sundby with William Blair. Yeah, hi. Thanks for uh, for taking my question and, and welcome. Um, Mike, I, I guess I just wanted to follow up on your, your comments on improving the Empark experience. You, you touched on time in tech and the, the role that needs to play. Um, just wondering if you could maybe then also talk about Warner and the DC Comics IP you have and the role that can play. And again, I appreciate it. It's, it's still very early days here for you, but uh, any thoughts on them as, as a partner? The, is it creating the right kind of immersive experience that you want? Can you lean into it harder? Any, any, any thoughts on that would be great. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thanks, Ryan, and I appreciate it. Uh, as, as you know, we have a, a partnership with uh, Warner Brothers, and um, it, it's it's been something we've had historically, and will continue to have. And uh, yeah, I do think we can leverage that. Um, we've also found that we have uh, great leverage in our base brands, our own brands, and our people. Uh, and I, I wouldn't say it's central to our park experience or what the guests or their consumers coming for. I, I think it's more of a complement uh, to what we offer, and uh, I would like to work with them to see if we can get more out of that relationship that's beneficial to our guests and the Six Flags. Okay, great. And then just a quick follow-up there on, on Alex's question. Um, it, I, I think the re, in your remarks you said international um, would be $30 million and, and the EBITDA decrease, um, which is what it contributed this year. Is there still EBITDA going to be coming from the Saudi park in 2020, or are you kind of excluding that now from, from your guidance? 
No, uh, you're exactly right. <clears throat> uh, based on where we are today in our international development group, uh, the margins are going to be significantly lower in 2020. So we will have the EBITDA that generates from the Saudi uh, agreement, uh, but we are going to have some exit costs associated with China in, until we develop, determine what's ultimately going to happen with the development of those parks, uh, as well as you know the cost of our international development group, which we're looking to kind of reallocate those resources into other areas of the business that will actually help uh, spur base business growth uh, for the long term. Got it. Thank you for the, the insight, guys. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Brett Andrus with KeyBank Capital Markets. Hey, thanks for letting me back on here. And I'm sorry if I missed this, but did you guide capital expenditures for 2020? I think you gave us some moving pieces around free cash, but did you give a, a CapEx number? Yeah, there's uh, – hey, Brett, how you doing? It's Mike again. Um, it, it's consistent uh, with what we've done previously. There's no change at this point. Um, we did not call it out specifically at this point. There's no change. And, again, as I said, as we uh, develop the capital allocation uh, portion of our strategy, we'll, we'll share all that uh, May 28th. Thank you for the clarification. Yes, sir. Our next question will come from the line of James Hardiman with Wedbush Securities. Hey, thanks. Thanks for a couple uh, quick follow-ups here. Um, I guess first, um, you talked a couple of times about uh, sort of being an open book here. The guidance and the disclosure were great. Love the fact that you guys actually gave us a 2020 guide, and in particular sort of broke out the organic versus inorganic for 2019. I, I think the lack of both was a source of a lot of frustration uh, for investors over the last couple of years. Can we expect these types of metrics going forward? I guess this is the question. I, I think certainly if you continue to acquire parks, it's sort of a different animal what your organic parks are doing, particularly as you talk about the strategy going forward uh, versus what you've acquired. Are, are you going to continue to provide these types of metrics? James, uh, hi, it's Mike again. Uh, my, my intent will always be to be uh, as transparent as possible unless it creates a competitive disadvantage. Um, if I think there's information that I'm sharing that uh, puts us at an arm's way from uh, disclosing information that is not proper for the long-term interest of shareholders um, or from a competitive standpoint, then we'll do what we have to do and we'll obviously be completely proper on that. And what you'll see at the Investor's Day is we'll, we'll share, and that's the whole reason I want to do an Investor's Day, is it'll just give us an opportunity to have an interactive session where we can transparently talk about our business, have an engagement discussion on the business so you know where we're going. And that'll be the, the real inflection point every year where we're able to give you a, a lot if that answers your questions. It does. And then lastly for me, and, and you've kind of touched on the membership program, cleaning it up, uh, but I wanted to ask it directly. Membership 2.0, the various tiers, do you ultimately think that that was the right strategy and do you think that in any way that contributed to, to some of the weakness uh, the last couple of years? So absolutely the right strategy, um, James, absolutely. Reoccurring revenue, driving increased frequency of loyal consumers, guests, customers, always, always the right thing to do because you're retaining a loyal, you're getting more share of wallet. Uh, in, in every business, uh, you just get such a lifetime value um, out of that guest, and I found that in every business. So, right thing to do. Um, and specific, we're, we're talking to our guests uh, at every park uh, as we test what they like and don't like about the membership. What do they want? Are there other things they want out of it as we rethink our base business investments? At the same time, as I said, um, People have a lot of choices, so I still, we still want those single day visits coming where somebody wants that experience. And ideally, once we get them to set up that first visit to Six Flags, if we give them that great guest experience, then we retain them. And that's exactly why you love membership because it gives them a vehicle to get more great experiences from Six Flags given the many things we can do in themed entertainment. But just yeah. to clarify, the membership on, on steroids is what I'm asking about, right? The platinum, the diamond, and the diamond elite um, that's more recent within the last year and a half. Yeah. Do you think that was the right strategy? 
Yeah, I, I, just looking at it from a base or from a base business standpoint, our our membership per caps are up 40% more than our season right. pass per cap. So it's absolutely the right long-term strategy because it drives the prices up and it ultimately brings more revenue in for all the people that are willing to to upgrade to those levels. So the question is is there a way to simplify the message and make it more attractive to get the people that are, that want that product? And that's what the research we're going to have to do going forward before uh, to to finalize our strategic plan. So. Perfect. Really appreciate it, guys, and good luck. Uh, thank thank you. you. Thanks for your question. I'll now turn the conference back over to management for any further remarks. Uh, thanks, Regina. Uh, I am thrilled to be part of the Six Flags team, and I'm looking forward to our next phase of growth. I look forward to seeing you out in one of our 26 parks in 2020 and at our investor day on May 28th. Thank you for joining our call, and more importantly, for your continued support. Take care, everyone, and thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's call. Thank you all for joining, and you may now disconnect.